just want to welcome you to this very special series on the civilization of love versus the civilization of death. And uh, we're, we're talking about a, a breakthrough here if we just follow uh, the teachings of the church uh, to truly find happiness in married life. And we're with Father Frank Pavone. Father Pavone is the founding director of the Priest for Life. And we're going through this uh, little document, Humani Viti and Human Life, so small but so powerful. And Father, what, what sections do you want to share now? Well, we're looking at section number nine where uh, mm -hmm. Pope Paul VI said, there are certain characteristics of married love that mm -hmm. belong to it essentially. Uh, and he lists four of them. And he says they belong to, to married love by the design of God. This is not our opinion about mm -hmm. what mar how marriage should be lived, but he, he bases this all in the context of saying, look, God has revealed to us mm -hmm. that he's the creator of marriage. He has a plan for it. And when we read these things, we, we should not think of them as impositions by the church upon us, but rather the church revealing to us what is for our own happiness and mm -hmm. fulfillment. It's how we're made. We're made right. according to this truth. So we've, in the past, talked about the... Uh, these, these characteristics. He says it's human, this married love is human, it's total, it's faithful, and it's fruitful. Mm -hmm. um, human and total, we do not just act on instinct and we do not hold back any of ourselves when we give ourselves to our spouse. But to look more uh, in more detail at what he says about it being faithful and fruitful, the encyclical reads in this way, section 9, again mm -hmm. this love is faithful and exclusive until death. This is so important. Gosh, it's Isn't so it? important. Because you know, you just uh, you know, when you're when you're un when you're not faithful with your own partner on this, then you're opening yourself up to be unfaithful in other areas too. Yeah. And and you're just weakening your own self to uh, uh, to be faithful to your spouse. And this exclusivity uh, uh, is weakened too when you're starting to cheat uh, with God with your own partner then you're going to start to be open to these temptations outside. You know, uh, you rarely hear a sermon that quotes God's words in the Old Testament that says, I hate divorce, says the Lord. Mm. I hate it. Mm -hmm. uh, and he describes the infidelity of his people to, hit the, to the covenant mm -hmm. in terms of adultery. Mm -hmm. He says, my people, you're committing adultery. I am your spouse, God the Lord. So I, I love preaching at, at weddings. Mm. Um, and you know the the, the video uh, the video person often controls the ceremony mm -hmm. and or thinks that that he does. Uh, but I always told the videographer, please don't turn the camera off when it comes to the homily. No, that's what you want because, to say. Because exactly, Gosh, and the, and I look right into the camera and I say to these to this couple, I said, you're going to be watching this hopefully, 25 years from now, mm -hmm. 30 years from now, 50 years from now, and on the day that you watch this, I want you to remember one thing. The promise that you made on your wedding day, the two of you were not the only ones making promises. God was making a promise. Mm -hmm. He was making a vow. And here's the vow that he made, that all the grace and strength you need to be faithful to each other until death, I am giving you. I guarantee you it will be there. But you need to reach out to me and take it. Right. But it will be there. God never asks us to do the impossible. Mm -hmm. And when we say on, on, a, on a marriage day, uh, I, I give myself to you until death do us part. Right. And we mean that God is going to make that possible. Now, people often don't reach out to the Lord to get mm -hmm. that, that help, but the fact is that he's making that promise. Because that's, that's that sacrament of matrimony, isn't he? Because right. that, that sacrament just isn't a, a one-time sacrament at the time you receive it on the day. We were married August 15, uh, 1959, and, um, but that sacrament kept, keeps going throughout your marriage. Yes. And you call on the graces of yeah. that sacrament. Precisely, you know? precisely. Yeah. You know, it's a courageous act to make a mm -hmm. marriage vow because, you know, you, you're saying to that person, I accept you, uh, but I don't know what you're going to be like five mm -hmm. years from now. In fact, I don't know what you're going to be like five minutes from That's now. Right. We, ne we don't know what's ab ever what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. And yet we're saying yes to something that we don't know what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. we, we're saying yes anyway. So no matter what happens to you, perhaps you know, you're beautiful today on our wedding day. Perhaps tomorrow you'll be all disfigured because mm -hmm. you may be in an accident tonight. Right. We just don't know. And yet I'm saying yes anyway. Mm -hmm. No matter what's coming down the road, no matter what's in the future, we know one thing. God's already there. Right. And that same God is, is, is giving us the grace to stay faithful. Mm -hmm. So then the Holy Father goes on, Bride and groom conceive it to be on the day when they freely and in full awareness assume the duty of the marriage bond. 
a fidelity, this which can sometimes be difficult but is always possible, always noble and meritorious, as no one can deny. Mm -hmm. uh, the example of so many married persons down through the centuries shows not only that fidelity is according to the nature of marriage, but also that it is a source of profound and lasting happiness. Then he goes into the fourth characteristic of married love. He says, finally, this love is fruitful, for it is not exhausted by the communion between husband and wife, but is destined mm -hmm. to continue raising up new lives. Mm -hmm. You know, in the marriage ceremony itself, several questions are asked of the, of the spouses. Uh, will you be faithful to each other all your life, and so on. But then one of the questions is, will you accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and His church? People need to understand that if a couple, if either one of the spouses, upon going into marriage, says in their mind and heart, I am never going to want children. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely... Now, we're not talking about being incapable physically yeah, of having right. children. We're talking about a decision never to accept children. That marriage is actually invalid. So that was never a sacrament. Then. That doesn't become a sacrament mm -hmm. because the marriage doesn't depend only on the priest being there. It depends on the spouses saying yes to what marriage is the way God designed it. Mm -hmm. And what the Pope here is saying is an essential part of that is that you are ready to accept, the word that you use there is accept, the gift of children from God. Now, a gift is something that we can neither demand mm -hmm. nor should we throw it away back in the, in the face of God. A gift is a gift. We receive it, we accept it, uh, and yet the obligation here is to be ready to accept it, willing to accept it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's the key. I, I think this whole... Uh this whole idea of this supreme gift of marriage, and uh, it, it, we have to understand it is a gift, and if we're open to life, uh, these children will bring happiness and uh, to you that, sure, there are going to be trials, but uh, the grace is far greater than the sacrifice. And, um, and we see this in, just, in Gwen's life. All I can say is the way she died, she wanted family around her. The family was around her. Mm. They... they uh, uh, the grandchildren saw her dying, and uh, she was interacting with them. And there was a there was a joy, even though they, she knew she was dying. There was a joy there, of life. The kids were around, and because uh, and she 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 never regretted having a large family, and she just knows that these children will live forever. And she gave a letter to uh, she's my, my son Michael sort of worked with her. Cause she could hardly talk, mm. but he said, "Mom, what are your last words?" And uh, and then he uh, read, uh, pulled out a letter, took it off the set here. But uh, I think I have it here. But it is uh, just a beautiful memory where she talks about a letter to her family, and and she got down to the basic core of it because. Uh, Let's see if I can find it here. Because Gwen was really a person for others. She really wanted just to have those children live for the Lord. And she ended her, her days with, um, to my dear family, I've been thinking about writing you for the last couple of days. I was a bit difficult to write this letter because I was feeling very sick, unlike the days on earth when I was, when I was with you. However, they are coming to an end. Not that I didn't want to write, but I couldn't think of it because of my sickness. I hope my words can come through now better. It is easy to say I love you over and over again. It is not enough, but you have been the most wonderful, helpful, loving family I could ever want. There is so much. It was Jesus that brought us and kept us together. Isn't that something? I mean, she was talking about it was Jesus that brought these children in. And I have a strong husband, and I can't forget that he has been everything to me. I love him very much. Now, this is the key. My prayerful wish is that each one of my children will raise their families close to God. Mm -hmm. And this is her closing testimony. And find God's will for their life. All my grandchildren, I love you, Mom. And that was her last letter that she dictated to my son, Michael, five days before she died. And... Uh, but she was just worried about them finding out what God's plan is for your life. Right. Because if we have that type of attitude, then you will find the happiness. She found that happiness right to the end of yeah, her of she, her life. She really did. And, and uh, so it, it was just a, 
you know, where other people are not having children and they're dying lonely lives, mm. uh, mm. lonely deaths. I mean, there's nobody around them, and uh, or they're, uh, or if those children see that their pe- parents are practicing birth control, artificial contraceptive, not allowing life in, when it comes time for taking care of them at death, they don't want to be bothered. They put them away, you know. And if they wait too long uh, before having a child, they they tend to uh, settle into a pattern where they're just revolving around each other. And right. the longer you wait, the harder it is. Oh, it is. It, that's right. It's uh, it's amazing. Uh, uh, these children form you, and uh, they, they they form you into a into a saint because they're for, forcing you to be selfless. And the more selfless you are, the closer right. you are to God. Well, Father, thank you. And thank you. We're going to continue with this series on the culture of life versus the culture of death. And uh, we have this opportunity to bring about the civilization of love that John Paul has has so clearly uh, given us if we follow his directives. We'll be right back.